New technologies, emerging threats, and global events are shaping the digital landscape today in unprecedented ways, and the Central Intelligence Agency must adapt to and embrace these changes to stay ahead. In this interview, we spoke with Jennifer Eubank, Deputy Director of Digital Innovation at the CIA and a 2023 WASH 100 Award winner, to find out how the CIA is harnessing technology and innovation for intelligence missions. If you enjoy this interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. And if you're interested in being interviewed, email summer at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Jennifer Eubank, Deputy Director of the CIA for Digital Innovation. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here, Summer. I really appreciate the invitation. It's, it's an honor to talk to you today and to have an opportunity to, I know, share CIA's story with some of your viewers. So to start, Jennifer, what's your take on the global intelligence landscape today? What are the trends and factors shaping the CIA's missions? Yeah, that, that's really a great place to start, Summer. I'm glad you chose that because it really does sort of set the stage for the rest of uh, what I'm expecting to be a really great conversation. I've, I've seen your past interviews and I know that you have fantastic questions. But I, I would focus on two major shifts in the intelligence landscape in recent years. One would be this whole world of emerging technologies, largely in the digital domain, but not exclusively. And the other, I would say, would be the rise of the People's Republic of China as, let's just say, a pacing challenge for us. And our director, uh, Director Bill Burns, has said that the PRC represents you know, the most important geopolitical threat that we face in the 21st century. And you know, I tie digital technology and the PRC together kind of every single day at work because much of that competition is playing out across the digital landscape. And to give you one very quick example before we turn to other questions is cyber. So those who tracked cyber issues, you know, let's say 10 years ago, eight years ago, even seven years ago, there was a certain image. The PRC was, they were masters at kind of brute force attacks, you know, smash and grab, steal our personal data and our intellectual property but in a relatively unsophisticated and forceful manner. But that still happens from time to time. Don't get me wrong. But, but today, I have to say, China presents the, the, the broadest, most sophisticated, most persistent, most pervasive cyber espionage threat to U.S. government and private sector networks in America, full stop. And in recent years, there really has been this dramatic transformation of the intelligence landscape. You know, fueled by you know dramatic technological transformation, again largely digital but not exclusively. You know, we've got cyber intrusion, cyber attacks, big data, you know, artificial intelligence, high-powered computing somewhere on the horizon, quantum computing. Like all these things are changing day-to-day -day life for Americans and frankly for everyone around the world, and they're changing how we do our work as intelligence officers. And I think about some of today's most, most daunting challenges we face in the national security realm. So think about things like you know, criminal ransomware. It's just exploded on the scene in the last couple of years. There's an illegal war in the heart of, of Europe. Um, we've got this rise of authoritarian regimes all around the world. And, and let's not forget, terrorists are out there plotting still to attack our country and our interests around the world. And, and I mention all that because we don't think about it this way, but they all share something in common, and that is their use of digital technologies to, to spread their message and kind of amplify that message. And, and so for the CIA, if we go back to the intelligence landscape, our competitive, competitiveness as a service, right, our success and America's national security by extension will really rely on how rapidly like we turn all of this to our own advantage. And I'm really happy to say that CIA is doing that today, every day, and um, I'm really proud to be part of that, that team. We've been talking a lot about changes in the digital landscape. I'm curious, can you elaborate on how the digital world is impacting intelligence missions and how the CIA is adapting to and embracing these changes? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. 
we have to adapt and we have to embrace these things, right? We can't just pretend that they don't happen and don't exist. But so we have to embrace these new technologies for our mission. And we have to protect ourselves against them uh, being used by our adversaries at the same time. And, and I just ask, you know, imagine for, for just a moment, right? You're, you're part of this secret intelligence and secret espionage organization that is all around the world trying to collect you know really critical insights about the plans and intentions of our adversaries and yet you know, think about this world today we live in this this environment of ubiquitous sensing like something is always recording what we do where we go who we meet what we say you've got commercial satellites you've got vehicle telemetry and uh, facial recognition cameras and and let's not forget everyone's carrying around this multifunctional sensor in their pocket right in the form of of a really powerful cell phone and so I think you get the picture how challenging that can be to remain unseen unknown undetected in conducting a really dangerous mission so there are there are three things that we're focused on lots of other things but I'll, I'll, I'll touch on three that are really key areas of focus for us that are helping to kind of drive this adaptation and innovation across the CIA. And, and the first, again, is this, this cyber area. So the online world is probably more treacherous and threatening than, than ever before. And, and that's whether we're talking about the world's most sophisticated state actors or really aggressive cyber criminals. Um, think of the impacts of the ransomware attacks that we've seen over the last few years, and we get a sense of what that would be like at scale. But what's interesting about CIA, what I wanted to, to touch on is that we have the unique role of offense and defense, right? And, and we don't play as separate teams. We play as an integrated team. And the power of that integration, that you know, black hat, white hat, you know, blue team, red team, whatever terminology you want to use, there is real power in that. It unlocks extraordinary innovation, critical thinking, and intense mission focus. It's it is one of our, our key attributes, I think, that, that helps to drive success in the cyber realm for CIA. The second area is data. So, okay, every big company, every U.S. government agency department, frankly, every foreign government that I've spoken to in recent years, we're all grappling with, with data. And we're, we're thinking about kind of how do we leverage this incredible kind of exponential increase in volume and variety of data and and how do we leverage all of that for new insights, right? Of course, we're, we're working hard on artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us do that. And, and maybe we'll have a moment to come back to that because I think that's a really interesting aspect of CIA's mission today. And then the, the third area I would focus on is open source. We don't talk about that as much as we should. Little known, I think, to the average public, but the open source mission has been a huge part of CIA's mission since even before we were created. Our open source organization predates the CIA and then was brought into the CIA. And in this world where secrets are harder and harder and harder to collect, and there's more and more information available publicly, well, you know, what fools would we be if we weren't maximizing the value of all of that open source information? You know, we call it OSINT. We always have acronyms for everything or, you know, short abbreviations. And so INT is our word for intelligence, OSINT, open source. It is really, really critical to our success as an agency. And Jennifer, as you mentioned earlier, artificial intelligence is really seeing a boom right now, especially with the rise of generative AI tools earlier this year. Can you talk about the challenges and rewards of deploying AI in CIA missions? And how is the agency adapting to, responding to generative AI. Thank you. Thank you, Summer. I'm glad we came back to that because, um, you know, AI is, is uh, really topical right now. But, you know, although I would say most of America is really you know, focused on this with the recent kind of public release of various large language models, CIA has been focused on this for, for quite some time. And as I mentioned, we talked about this exponential increase in data and you know, this world of ubiquitous sensing and and all of that is it's both like it's it's a challenge for doing our secret mission and remaining secret but it's also a powerful potential capability for us but you know I, I as I remind people frequently right you know data is not information and information is not insight so you know how do you how do you get from you know a bunch of ones and zeros 
to actual insight that we can use for you know, our analytic judgments that we give to policymakers or you know, some kind of advantage for an operations officer who's on the streets in some hostile capital somewhere around the world. And, and, and really to do that kind of at the speed of mission and at the scale that we're seeing with this you know, incredible deluge of data, we're really going to have to use machines. We're going to have to learn how to partner better with machines. And we are making, I think, a lot of progress in that regard. And, but there are a lot of things that we're doing to support this, this mission. And I think about our foreign language officers and the ability to, to kind of triage and select and translate, and transcribe and summarize, you know, all the, this amazing volume of foreign language information out there that we're collecting around the world in order to kind of pluck out the insights that we need. And, and I think about partners in the military, right, who are using AI to kind of focus on and identify and understand objects in their environment. The object detection is a, a really important piece of AI. And I think about analysts, right? If you are, if you're an analyst in the CIA today, that means you're an all source analyst. You look at information from all the various ints as we call them. And um, it was one thing to do that in 1985 and to come to work every day and read a queue of reporting that came in, but you can't do that anymore. It's just, it, it would be a flood and you need AI to help you kind of triage and synthesize and kind of push to the fore those things that require your, your attention, require human attention and evaluation. And we're, we're doing that today. At the same time, and going back to that theme of kind of um, benefits and potential vulnerabilities, our, our adversaries are, are very aggressive in this space too, and we have to remember that. So they can weaponize and maybe occasionally are weaponizing this technology against us. And, uh, we've seen some pretty you know, dramatic examples of, of deep fakes, right? It's a powerful form of AI. In this threat environment, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention before I turn to other examples is how AI and big data are, are let's say, strengthening the hand of authoritarian re regimes around the world. And, you know, this kind of digital autocracy, as I, as I tend to call them, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really powerful trend and you know they, they leverage these technologies often to really devastating effect and, and it's it's something I think we should be studying and talking about a bit more. But I'm saying all this because we can't simply sit back and not embrace this new world. We have to somehow embrace it, leverage it, develop it, use it for you know the forces of good, as I would like to say. And but we can't just you know dive head first um, blindly into this AI future without thinking deeply about things like our, our values, our policies, our law, our ethics, you know, all of that has to be at the core of everything we're doing in the AI world. And, and I find that our partners are often surprised when I tell them that that has been from day one on our big artificial intelligence initiatives and programs, that's been baked in. We think about privacy, we think about civil liberties, we think about our values as a country, right? We're out around the world at the pointy end of the spear, as people like to say, you know, defending American values. But you know, I'll, I'll be darned, we better represent those values, you know, across the tech spectrum too. And so it's really important that in doing this work, we focus on America's values. That is uh, something that we talk about every day at CIA. Thank you, Jennifer. And I want to return to something you mentioned earlier, which is partnerships. You said they, you know, underpin kind of the three big areas that the CIA is focused on. But you also mentioned that um, the CIA is usually dealing with the country's most top secret, most classified missions. So I'm wondering how you square those two things. How is the CIA working to maybe overcome classification barriers in order to work more closely with industry? It's a good question. Thank you, Summer. And the reality is that the CIA is a you know, secret intelligence service and we work around the world to gather secret information. And we will always protect that and protect our sources and protect the information that we collect. But, you know, in this digital landscape in particular, and I, I mentioned this in passing, DDI, Director of Digital Innovation, is, is kind of the, I think, the most external facing part of the CIA by design because we recognized from the very beginning that these partnerships with American industry are gonna be critical to our success. You know, unlike you know, decades past, most innovation in the digital landscape is coming uh, from American industry. 
And so we need to be, you know, like hand in glove, you know, shoulder to shoulder, whatever term we want to use with industry. And we need to build those partnerships. And so DDI does take a slightly different approach than, than we have traditionally at CIA. We, you'll see us on the tech conference circuit, a number of seniors from, from my organization. We're out, we're on panels, we're giving speeches, we're doing keynote addresses, you name it. We're out a lot. Uh, I think most, most interestingly for many people earlier this year was um, our parents or four of us at South by Southwest, where you know we did our best to share information about the future of the intelligence mission while at the same time, and, and talking about technology, but you know, while protecting the things we have to protect. Um, and, and we've moved into other kind of new territories for CIA, podcasts, webinars, interviews, you know, like this one summer, you know, thank you again for the invitation because getting CIA's message out, I think is really critically important for these partnerships to build them, to identify new partners, to strengthen them. We've done a couple other things too. Uh, these things, they're small, but I think they are powerful. CIA's website is actually a really fantastic resource for people who want to, to learn about the agency. You know, government websites are usually not that great, to be candid. Um, I think this one is really rich with content. And we, we established a page, which we probably should have established years ago, specifically devoted to technology. So you know, cia.gov slash tech. It's kind of a landing zone. If you had questions about what we're interested in, what we're doing, you want to reach out and make contact with the CIA to explore partnerships if you're new company with some cutting edge tech, uh, you don't know how to contact the CIA, that's, that's a really great way. And finally, I'd mentioned that we're, we are uh, very active on social media these days. You'll see our social media feeds on all the major platforms of CIA, but also a few of us are, are really active on LinkedIn. It's, it's kind of where the IT data and artificial intelligence community goes to meet. I'm, I'm one of them. And uh, I, I try to find ways to share information about our mission and what we're doing to give companies ideas about how they might partner with us. And my direct messages are, I think, one of the, the most um, fruitful resources for making new connections with industry. I, I read every message and I, I am committed to putting people in touch with the right points of contact. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today and for all the work you do at the CIA. Thank you, Summer. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you today.